Let's move on now to sagittal balancing of knee arthroplasty. We'll start with uh, another uh, question. Here we have a 66-year-old male undergoing knee arthroplasty with a fixed bearing posterior stabilized implant. During intraoperative trialing of the components, it is noted that the flexion gap is loose and the extension gap is good. If the surgeon leaves this and does not correct this problem, what postoperative complication is this patient at risk of having? Spin out of the polyethylene, periprosthetic fracture, posterior knee dislocation, osteolysis, or patellar instability? Well, the answer is a posterior knee uh, dislocation. If you have a posterior stabilized knee, which obviously has a stabilizing post and a cam bar on the femoral component, if you have significant laxity in flexion, uh, when the patient flexes their knee excessively or typically puts their leg in the figure four position, you can actually go ahead and subsequently jump the post which results in dislocation. And I am sorry here, but all of a sudden my slide, uh, my slides have gone away. Now they're back, thank you very much for that. All right, so let's talk about uh, balancing. And certainly our goal is to obtain equal flexion and extension gaps to assure that the knee is stable throughout the entire range of flexion. And balancing is complex because you have to consider two radii of curvature uh, and both the patellofemoral articulation and the tibiofemoral articulation. <clears throat> General uh, rules to remember, and these are very, very important. You adjust the femur if you have gaps that aren't balanced between femur and tibia. Remember, your distal femoral cut affects only the extension gap. Your poster femoral cut affects only the flexion gap, where your tibial cut is common to both the flexion and extension gap. And remember, if you are increasing or decreasing the size of the femoral component, that changes only the AP diameter and affects the flexion gap only. So again, very important principle. Distal femoral cut, extension gap only. Poster femoral cut, extension, or flexion gap only. And tibial cut affects both flexion and extension. And this here is what I call the flexion extension ga gap balancing game. And remember in the operating room that there are nine different flexion extension gap relationships that you may encounter. Flexion can be uh, tight in flexion, tight in extension. You can have tight in flexion, loose in extension. And in each one of these relationships, there is a different surgical action that you need to take. And we're going to review each one of these. So if you have a knee that is tight in extension and tight in flexion, typically the problem is enough tibia was not resected. And typically you can solve this simply by resecting more proximal tibia. What about the knee that is tight in extension and well balanced in flexion? Here, the patient clinically usually has a flexion contracture. Well, the problem in this situation typically is enough distal femur was not resected, or in some cases, the poster capsule is excessively tight. So what is the solution? If you're tight in extension, well-balanced in flexion, most commonly, you will just cut a bit more distal femur and or release the poster capsule if it is tight. What about the knee that is tight in extension and loose in flexion? Here, typically the distal femur is a bit too long. So if you just go ahead and resect more distal femur or use in a revision scenario 
a thinner distal femoral augmentation, this will usually take care of it. Your other alternative is to upsize the femur. And remember, larger femoral component affects flexion gap only, so that will tighten your flexion gap. So two alternatives, probably the most common, is to resect a bit more femoral bone. Number two is to upsize your femur to tighten your flexion gap. Next scenario, balanced in extension, tight in flexion. Here the problem is usually enough bone was not resected by the posterior femur. You can also see this if you have a, a excessively scarred and contracted PCL. What is the solution? Here, if you decrease femoral component size, which will require an increase in bone resection of the posterior femoral condyles, that will correct your tightness and flexion. Other alternatives, if you are, uh, uh, have, are, are still retaining the posterior cruciate ligament, Sometimes you can get rid of the tight flexion gap by recessing or releasing the PCL, releasing the posterior capsule, or occasionally increasing your posterior tibial slope. What happens if you're balanced in flexion extension? That's nirvana. You did a great job. Nothing is done. That's what you want. So you don't have to do anything in that flexion extension gap relationship. Okay. Now, we're balanced in extension, loose in flexion. What is the problem? Typically, too much posterior femoral bone is resected. What is the solution? Typically, you increase the size of your femoral component. And this may, if you have already over-resected too much femur posteriorly, require the addition of posterior femoral augments. Or, if you can go ahead and posteriorize your femoral component a bit more, and this again may require augmentation of the femur by bringing your femur a bit more posterior. Obviously, you don't want to excessively notch in doing so, but this can go ahead and correct your loose flexion gaps. Next is your loose and extension, tight in flexion. In this situation, you often want to downsize your femoral component, and this will subsequently get rid of your tightness and flexion, and then you can increase your tibial bearing a bit until you are balanced. How about loose and extension, balanced in flexion? Here, the problem, too much distal femoral resection. And here you can solve that problem simply by uh, augmenting the distal femur, which lengthens your femur and will subsequently correct the looseness in extension. Next, loose in extension, loose in flexion. The problem here, typically you have over-resected the tibia. Usually can be solved by just simply using a thicker tibial insert. But again, uh, and I, I do this more in a revision scenario, if I have uh, a patient that's under 70 years of age, and to correct this problem, I require maybe a 22 millimeter thick insert. I don't have a lot more inserts, thicknesses to use in the future of this relatively young patient. So sometimes what I'll do in that situation is I may add 10 millimeter uh, medial and lateral metal augments to the undersurface of the tibial tray, and then I can take my insert thickness down to 12 millimeters, which will allow me in the future, should more instability occur, I have more thicknesses of tibial polyethylene bearings to use. And in general, I think a principle in revision is with every revision, you also sh always should be thinking of the next revision. And so I use that mentality if I get up to excessively thick tibial polyethylene bearing thicknesses. If I'm dealing with a patient who may be 80 years of age or, or more and has a limited life expectancy, just due to cost, I would use that thicker tibial polyethylene insert. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments.
Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.